Hello and welcome to Growing Tech Fast, the condensed Org3D podcast, where we talk about growing tech startups with those who have grown them. Today I'm joined by Pete Fishman. He has been an analytics leader for several years and has been involved with multiple startups and acquisitions. He's also an angel investor and has more recently co-founded and built a startup in the big data space. Pete, it's a pleasure to have you on the pod today. How are you doing? Thanks, Ben. Great to be here. Fantastic. Well, for the benefit of our listeners, Pete, perhaps we should kick off um, by you telling us a little bit about who you are, what your mission is, and the work that you're doing at the moment. Great. So um, I'm Pete Fishman. I go by Fish. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Mozart Data. Um, And what we are is the easiest way for teams to spin up a modern data stack. And what that means in practice is that we basically help companies set up the types of data infrastructure that, you know, larger companies or later stage uh, startups use, uh, but making that available really to almost everyone. Okay, perfect. That's really, uh, really great summary. Thank you. Now, I wanted to start off by talking about kind of your experience with uh, startups in general uh, so far. Now, I know that you've been at a few startups sort of during their growth phase that have then been acquired and sort of absorbed into much, much larger organizations. Can you tell me a bit about those experiences, what the kind of advantages and disadvantages of an acquisition might be, and also how that might change the kind of functionality or or culture of a startup? So uh, my, my first two startups um, that I joined ended up uh, getting acquired. So first I joined a company called Playdom, which was uh, a social video games company, uh, mostly building games on top of Facebook. Uh, and that company got acquired by Disney to be part of uh, what was called Dimji, uh, which was basically uh, their games group. And then I joined Yammer, uh, which shortly thereafter, after a nice uh, set of growth, which was an enterprise social network uh, that ultimately got acquired by Microsoft and uh, became part of the greater Microsoft ecosystem. Now, um, some of the you know, advantages to kind of these startups and some of the things that put us in a position to be acquired was just how nimble and quick and sort of uh, creative uh, these companies were at sort of taking advantage of sort of new markets. So, you know, with uh, Playdom, uh, Facebook, you know, while it had, you know, a billion users, it was really chugging towards 2 billion. And, um, and part of that real growth was getting people to engage with the platform and interact with their newsfeed. Um, and a big part of that was these sort of, Um, almost silly video games uh, that people would play uh, on Facebook, but it was a very, it was a new ecosystem. It was a new system for interacting with people and having them be able to interact with their friends. And really games are always much better when you're playing them with your friends. Um, So, so then we were acquired by Disney. I actually only stayed uh, for a short while, like less than six months. Um, I think some people really have startup DNA in them. And, uh, you know, what was great about Disney is that, you know, obviously it's a uh, well-resourced company, but beyond that, uh, an incredible brand with incredible brand assets. Um, And that gave us sort of the ability to pivot into, you know, games with, uh, you know, with essentially branded assets. Um, And, you know, for me, what was really exciting about Playdom, I actually wasn't a gamer really by background. I was an economist by trade. Um, and what got me interested was it was just a very new space and we were really figuring out all the economics of building on top of, of an enterprise, uh, sorry, a social network like, like, mm. like Facebook. When I went to Microsoft, uh, sorry, after Yammer was acquired, um, there I actually stayed for uh, three years and sort of joined, you know, for a SharePoint and then more broadly Office 365. And, you know, one of the big differences between a big company and a startup is that there was clearly much more structure. I had, you know, a number, which was my level, and I had, you know, reports and skip reports, and I had bosses and skip bosses. And, and I think, like, um, one, 
you know, that organization needs to be in place to move sort of a battleship like Microsoft. Um, but I think one of the key differences is whether you sort of operate at your highest level within a very structured organization or whether or not you like a little bit of the chaos of it's not clear what you're doing today. Okay, that's really interesting. So I guess a follow on from, from that would be, um, you know, you're kind of juxtaposing the, the chaos, but the, the agility of a startup with the sort of structure of, of a, a larger battleship as you say there w do you think that having that structure is, an, is, a, is a necessity for a company to reach that kind of size and and where do you think that transition actually starts to happen in a company's growth so i mean that that transition to me starts happening once you hire your first hr person so a people and, and hr now is generally called people you know people leaders are actually very like uh, to me, very necessary and very integral. In fact, um, one of our first, I, I, I think I think she was our, uh, you know, fifth or sixth employee was actually a people person to run sort of kind of our our actual growth. So we, we believe in putting in that infrastructure pretty early on. So I think like, um, you know, obviously there are different gradations. So ultimately what somebody that's, you know, in charge of people is trying to do is get the most out of the people of the company. Um, and that can be a number of things that can be cultural initiatives that can be like really focusing on building, you know, good funnel in terms of, uh, you know, hi hiring top of funnel hiring where, you know, you're thoughtful about DNI. Um, and it can be a, a number of kind of initiatives that, you know, sort of a first sort of people person would take on. Um, we, we put that person in place very early, but I think that that sort of graduation towards sort of the extensive Microsoft structure really starts the second that you put in somebody whose sole focus is to think about, you know, not just company, you know, uh, culture, but company structure. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting observation and interesting as well that, that you've decided to, to do that so early. I mean, a lot of people reach the kind of 60 or 80 employee mark before they make that kind of decision. Um, so something that you've kind of touched on briefly at the beginning there is that you, you've been active in, in several different, different kind of verticals and, and industries across your career. I mean, notably kind of social networking, HR tech, um, real estate as well, Canatech, I know you've been a part of throughout your career. So what I wanted to ask is, how do you approach the process of understanding a new market and which of those has been your favorite to actually operate in so far? So, uh, yeah, I, I actually have sort of jumped between verticals, like all, all throughout. There's sort of almost no consistency <laughs> to uh, my professional path, um, other than one sort of underlying theme, which is I've, I've almost always worked in data and, mm. and analytics and leveraged, you know, my core skill, which is basically you know, working with data sets, thinking about data sets and thinking about experiments and, and causality. And, um, but you're right, I, I, you know, I jumped from, actually, I, I started my career, let's like, say in the NFL, um, not as a player, but doing statistics. And then I, you know, I worked, you know, in, in tech startups, um, in, in a variety, um, uh, a variety of different, um, a variety of different uh, context, right? So you mentioned I most recently worked in cannabis. I had previously worked in, you know, real estate tech. Um, I had I have worked in HR and and HR tech. Um, and and the and you know you think of these as very different, um, but in reality, a lot of the problems are very much the same. It's writing down the equations of the business. It's really understanding what what are the um, what are the equations of like what explains how a business makes makes money, um, you know, or in the in the short run or the long run, and you know sometimes you know this is often, you know, how do you measure, you know, customer lifetime value and how do you measure the CAC of a customer, and that's a very um, that's a very consistent problem across businesses. So while the actual ways that the business makes money, uh, you know, changes and sort of the lifetimes of a user. So in real estate, you know, a user makes one purchase and then typically doesn't make another purchase, maybe for the rest of their life. 
Um, it might be, you know, seven years later as, as sort of a, a median, but, you know, for many people, they buy their forever home. Um, mm -hmm. The, the flip of it is if, you know, you're a games company, you hope somebody comes back at least once a day or maybe even multiple times a day. Um, you, know, uh, you know, in cannabis, um, you know, the sort of the, the highest end consumers were, you know, almost, you know, on, on, the, on the daily. So basically, um, you know, you have this sort of context that keeps changing, but at the end of the day, a lot of the problems end up being very similar. And almost all of these industries certainly benefit from you know, uh, exposing their data and, and thinking about it in, in ways that let, you know, with, with, a, with a lot of trained eye. Perfect. That's a really good answer. Interesting that that's been the kind of the, the, the consistent consistency throughout it has been not only your skill for, for analytics and data, but the need throughout those industries as well. Um, have you, have you had a favorite vertical so far that you've sort of been involved with in terms of just the day-to-day -day sort of activity at all? Well, I, I mean, just to be uh, a, a little present centric, I would say the most fun has been working at Mozart, my, you know, which has been my own company, which is of course uh, in, in the data space. So ironically, the vertical that we're talking about is the, is the data vertical. Um, so that's kind of like, uh, you know, someone that likes, you know, chocolate, chocolate chip ice cream. Um, so I would say that, yeah, I, I, I think like um, the, the most fun has been sort of this like crazy adventure of the past year, which is starting a company, you know, finding uh, the, the areas where we have, uh, you know, um, some product market fit and then going after, um, you know, those customers. Perfect. Thanks for that. Fantastic. Um, now, something that's obviously important uh, for, for, for pretty much all startups as well as investment. So I want to talk about that for a couple of minutes here. I know that you have experience on, on both sides of that coin, really, both giving uh, and receiving capital. So when you yourself are making an investment into an early stage company, what indicators of future success do you look for and why do they resonate most with you personally? So I've almost exclusively invested at the seed or pre-seed stage, um, done some very few small follow-ons. Um, I, I think the first thing is um, ultimately it is, you know, it's a cliche, but it is about the entrepreneurs themselves. So, um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, when I put a mirror up to our company, um, Dan and I are, uh, you know, data first and foremost, data people. So we have a lot of experience in the, in the data landscape. We're really scratching our own itch. I mean, one way to describe our company is basically uh, Dan as a service. Uh, so Dan is my, <laughs> is my CTO and co-founder. And uh, Dan, you know, basically what we're trying to do is bring Dan to a number of companies so that they don't have to hire their own Dan. Um, so I think like that to me is appealing when somebody has a tremendous amount in it, you know, you can make a lot of type two errors. So you can miss on a lot of great companies where a very, you know, driven entrepreneur is diving into a new space. Uh, you know, I think like that, that certainly um, is a possibility. In fact, ironically, you know, Dan and I actually co-founded a company 10 years ago, uh, which was a hot sauce company. Um, which was a totally new and different space to us. And, you know, it was, it was successful in, uh, in many dimensions. We sold hundreds of thousands of bottles, um, but it wasn't the type of sort of uh, success that we hope to achieve at Mozart Data. And part of that is kind of, there's an insight and opinion about the world, uh, in this case, the world of data, that Dan and I have um, from a number of years of experience. And that, to me, when I can find founders that, really are opinionated based on their past experiences. You know, now it's a delicate thing because sometimes you can be over-indexed to something that was relevant or true, uh, you know, a handful of years ago that now is obsoleted. But uh, so I think, um, you know, there's a very delicate balance, but often I look for great entrepreneurs, uh, but especially ones with experience in their field. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I think a follow-on question that uh, I'd like to ask is, 
Do you think that gaining substantial investment for your business is ever actually a damaging influence or should you always be seeking and, and moving towards it, the next influx of capital? Um, so you, I, I think I, I want to be very clear that Dan and I, from the start, always had the philosophy of we were trying to build a company not to go raise venture capital. We were trying to build a successful company. So, you know, sometimes kind of the measuring stick in Silicon Valley or in technology is, you know, what's the, what's the latest valuation of your last round? Um, and sort of chasing that, um, chasing that number is often a mistake. Um, now that said, um, you know, raising capital in an efficient way is the way for entrepreneurs and founders and even employees to get as, as much of the equity pie uh, of, of the value that they create as possible. So there is a little bit of tension, but absolutely not. You shouldn't be just chasing valuations. In fact, um, you know, I, I spent a chunk of my career at Zenefits, and one of the struggles we had at Zenefits was we had raised a very large round. Uh, I, think, I, think it, I think it's known it to be that our Series C was, was $500 million uh, at, at a many billion dollar valuation. And um, that was something that we had to grow into and we had to chase. And mm. chasing that valuation before we had really the, the right sort of team infrastructure, product market fit in place uh, to go to that valuation um, was, was what made it such a challenging uh, few years of my career. And ultimately, you know, part of the story of like a really cra crazy rapid rise and then also, a, a, you know, a, a descent. Wow, that yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and also, kind of uh, following on from that, really, is um, what do you think is more important um, for a company? You know, you say that you invest a lot in, in the kind of seed and pre-seed stage. Do you think that at that level, capital and investment is actually the most important thing, and above all, or do you think that advice is actually more valuable to someone at that level? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily be, you know, trading, you know, advice for equity in, in large swaths and chunks when you're at the pre-stage uh, level, um, you know, for, for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, if your company is going to be successful, you know, now that is the time where you're giving away uh, the most of your company. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, I've found a lot of our investors to be value add. So, um, you know, when you can be particular about who's giving you the capital, um, you know, getting value at investors are great. And, and often they provide um, advice like uh, gratis in some sense, uh, sort of backing up, um, you know, their investment in, in your company. So, you know, advice is something that's not so much a dime a dozen. In fact, you know, getting it from the right people, um, that have the right experiences, I think is, is very valuable. But, you know, I would say, you know, I think you sort of disproportionately want to, uh, you know, focus on the challenge of, you know, creating the company, creating the, the, the fit and the, the, the kindling and the, 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 you know, the seeds of traction. And then, you know, often the, the money will follow. Now, of course, it's a chicken and egg problem. You need some of it maybe to build that product that you're envisioning, envisioning that can get you that traction. Um, and, and, you know, for, for many people, that's too hard to bootstrap, whether they don't have uh, the technical chops or, the, or maybe the connections to, to get started. So often they're, you know, incubators uh, as well as sort of uh, angels um, and, and, and early stage funds can, can really push you far along. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I, I guess what we can kind of glean from that as well is that the real sweet spot is where it's not mutually exclusive and the people with the good advice are the same as the people with the, with the money as well. <laughs> that is the so, best. Yeah. So um, I want to talk more specifically now about your time at, at Mozart, um, what you're doing and kind of that journey. Um, in a kind of general sense, I, I wanted to ask, you know, Big data and analytics is uh, a large industry that's growing fast, and it's got some some huge players in it um, at the moment that seem to be kind of doing everything everywhere and all at once. 
can you tell me about the challenge of launching a new company in such a kind of large industry and how you can best position yourself in order to compete effectively? Sure. So, um, you know, you're right. Data is a, you know, a multi hundred billion dollar a year industry, uh, just sort of, uh, and, you know, you know, it's, it's really, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. And then we've seen some incredible, you know, companies even, even born in the last, uh, you know, decade, uh, in the data space. And, you know, uh, one of, you know, my favorites, of course, is, is Snowflake, um, you know, which is, uh, you know, part of the technologies that we use at Mozart Data. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's there's tremendous opportunity in the data space, um, and you know, big companies, small companies, successful small companies, and medium sized companies can all be created because basically different people consume data different ways. Um, there is no one uniform way to you know get the data the right way, and then essentially there is no one you know correct way of of analyzing the data or visualizing the data. It it is. Often, you know, the way that you manipulate data and your comfort levels with different languages or different, you know, uh, softwares, it, you know, it, it varies by company. And what that does is that creates opportunities, market opportunities, um, market opportunities. You know, there, there's not one flavor of ice cream. You know, it's not the case that we, we, we just have vanilla ice cream because vanilla is the best. Um, it's probably the most popular, but it's definitely not, in my mind, the best. Um, so what what happens is there's just uh, lots of where, where you when you think about sort of the data space, um, the opportunities are as these companies get bigger, as some of your sort of uh, like newest and best technologies get bigger, there's opportunities to build on top of those technologies, leverage those technologies, understand how you know customers use those or will use those, and then you know build things that complement those or build things to disrupt those. Um, all of those are real opportunities, but often companies that try to be everything to everyone end up being nothing. Um, in fact, you have to figure out who is your customer, whose problem are you, and by customer, I mean whose problem are you solving? Um, what problem are you solving? What pain point are you, uh, are you fixing? And when you do that, um, you really, you know, data were really, I mean, it's a cliche, but and uh, uh, you know, we'll go with the, the American sports cliche. We're in the first inning here. Um, so what that means is, to me, uh, there are so many companies, even mature and large companies, that are you know using you know nothing like you know either a modern data infrastructure or even just modern you know data approaches. People are you know I I used to work at Microsoft and I used to work on Excel, but it just sort of the 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 most common approach is. You know, take you know, grabbing CSVs or Excel files and then just sort of manipulating them in spreadsheets. Um, and that, you know, that today is still kind of by far the most common approach towards you know doing data analysis. And and now we have this unbelievable you know wealth of tools um, in the data space that make a lot of that work automated and so much so much faster and easier. And you know, companies are just you know, I mean, I focus on the small sort of uh, subset of companies that are already looking for that sort of modern approach, but there, you know, there's basically the the other 99.9% of the market that largely uh, is just ready to get started. Perfect. That's a fantastic answer, definitely. Um, now, you've obviously uh, you've recently marked one year since co-founding Mozart Data. Uh, firstly, huge congratulations on that <laughs> milestone. Um, what have been the challenges associated with starting a new business during the global COVID nineteen pandemic, and has there been any advantages? So yeah, we started in April uh, twenty twenty, which of course uh, almost the whole entire globe went into lockdown in March. Um, and, uh, so that, that was of course, um, a really crazy and special time to, uh, start a company. Um, there are many, many, many disadvantages to not being in person. I actually never worked in the same room as, as anybody else on the Mozart team. We all sort of, uh, interact with you know, Zoom and Slack and the sort of standard tools like that. Um, so, you know, there's, 
I think a variety of serendipity that happens in an office where somebody overhears something in one department that's going to be really critical to their work. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, that's clearly, you know, one of the many disadvantages. One of the many advantages that actually is sort of, uh, it's, it's almost accidental advantages is that, you know, one, we've, you know, we've saved so much, you know, resources in terms of getting started in a scrappy way. Obviously, no, no office, uh, no need for hours and hours of commute time. Um, but, you know, I think we also had never been an in-person company. So, like, you know, things that sort of plague in-person companies are sort of meeting culture or, um, you know, I think just like spending a lot of time you know, doing things that, you know, kind of the pandemic has, has shown not to be really necessary. So mm. since we never had that baggage, we've really had a nice ability, you know, to get started both, again, in a scrappy way um, without some overhead, but also in terms of laying down how we want to, you know, have the company interact and really, you know, making that bar really uh, like high in terms of, you know, using people's times that you know they they want to be doing fantastic yeah that, that's really interesting as well that it's provided a kind of unique environment for, for starting a grassroots business really and you haven't had to worry about some of the stuff that people probably didn't even realize was actually an issue before now um so i guess on that i'm conscious we're getting to the end of the the time here so i think a good final question for me would be if you were speaking to someone who was going to be starting a brand new startup in this space tomorrow what is the kind of one key piece of advice that you would give to someone about to start that journey um so i mean the first the first piece of advice is a little bit cliche but have a great co-founder i i think <laughs> like you know going it alone is uh an ex an ex uh it's it's already a challenging uh concept which is you know starting a company but doing it by yourself isn't like twice as challenging. It's, it's noticeably more difficult. Um, so, you know, work with somebody that, you know, you really trust and they trust you. Um, and that's, you know, first and foremost, I mean, one of the best parts of the, of, of my startup has not been sort of its growth to date, but it's been really the opportunity to work uh, with Dan again professionally. So that's really um, you know, my first piece of advice. And my second piece of advice is we took a, a cheat code, which is we leveraged uh, an incubator. So we we graduated from Y Combinator in the summer. And, you know, there's so much of sort of, um, you know, how to build a company from scratch that is sort of part of the incubator ecosystem. There's just a bunch of specialization on, you know, how to get your legal documents in shape, um, you know, when to raise money, what metrics you need to hit to go do that, um, how, you know, you know, the pressures of how much you need to talk to your customers before you really, you know, launch down that path. So, you know, my, my two best pieces of advice generally are, um, one, uh, obviously found it with someone, someone great, and then two, or, or multiple people that, that, you know, you trust and you think are great. Uh, and then the second part is, you know, when you can, you know, take, you know, shortcuts and trade off basically time for ownership. I mean, one of the things that Y Combinator did for us was really accelerate us towards becoming, you know, just like a real, you know, seed stage, uh, you know, capable of raising a seed company. And I think like that to me, like rather than sort of, you know, wander around for a bit and then figure it out. I think sort of just forcing yourself forward is really uh, critical for an entrepreneur. Perfect. Thank you. Another great answer, Pete. I mean, it's it's been fantastic speaking with you, and I think your your perspective um, and insights from someone who's founded a company so recently as well has been really really interesting to hear. So thanks so much for that, and uh, you. I wish you huge success in your sort of journey as you continue to, to grow and build your Dan as a service model. Uh, so wish you all the best for that. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure.